I am Courtney Lytle. I am an attorney here in town. I also teach intellectual property law at Emory Law School as an adjunct. Um, we're going to go through rather quickly a whole lot of stuff. Pretty much every individual topic I'm going to kind of talk to, I could spend a couple hours talking about and you still would not have a full understanding. So copyright law is not difficult. That's one of the reasons I love being a copyright attorney because it's really not hard. This is not like tax law where it's difficult. This is easy stuff for the most part, conceptually at least, but there's a lot of it. And y'all have a lot of questions also, so I'm going to breeze through and I'm gonna start with talking about different areas of intellectual property law. This is copyright 101, so we're gonna talk about copyright. But I want to make sure that we distinguish the other parts because some of y'all aren't coming in knowing the differences and you'll get confused as to why I'm only talking about um, drawings and books and not drugs and machines. Drugs and machines, look how well I segued that, are patents. When I'm here at EFF, I know there are people in the room who are very interested in patents, but we're not talking about that today. I'm not a patent lawyer. Here's one piece of information you should have. Patent lawyers are way smarter than I am. They took lots of science in college. They had to because in order to take the patent bar, yes, it's a separate test in order to be a patent lawyer, you have to have taken virtually pre-med levels of science classes. I took astronomy for mine. <laughs> I met a lot of nice football players. They were very kind. Um, and that was my science background. I'm not a patent lawyer. Because I'm not a patent lawyer, there's an awful lot within the field of patents that I am not allowed to do. If you are one of those science people, when you need a patent file or you need a patent lawyer, please hire a patent attorney and ask them specifically. There are different carve-outs here and there that even someone who's not a patent lawyer can do some of the filing work and stuff. Yeah, don't do them because I would make a muddle of it, I assure you. So if you need a patent file, you better have you know, $20,000 or so in several years of your life to devote to it. Hire a real honest to God patent lawyer. Patents are your machines, your inventions, your chemicals, your DNA stuff that they're managing to patent. All of those things we're not talking about today. Trademark is the next one. This is the one that people really do get confused about. This, see, they provided my props for me. I didn't have to steal from unsuspecting people in the audience. I'm rocking today. <laughs> this used to have a product in it. Does everyone know what was in it? Yeah. If you slice your veins open, probably half and half in there about now. Yeah. Um, the non-coffee people live on this. This is Mountain Dew. I love Mountain Dew. I can't say that loudly because we're in Coke Town, but still. Coke doesn't make a competitor in my mind, so it should be okay. But that's my religious exemption here. Because this says Mountain Dew with a recognizable label on the product, you know what was in here. More importantly, when Scott bought this this morning, he knew what he was buying. Trademark is company names, product names, logos, all kinds of stuff that can identify your product. And it is done with the intention of protecting us, the consumer. There is some law that benefits us, and this is one of them. This tells you what you're buying. You can rely on knowing what you're getting. Lovely sugary caffeine. It's a fabulous thing. The elixir of life, this stuff is. But I know what I'm getting when I buy it. Scott knew what he was buying, or what he was getting when he bought it. We're all happy. That's trademark law. If you have a company name, or a slogan, or a logo, a series of books, something like that, you may want to think about trademarking it. Trademarking is done through the federal government. There are state trademarks, but just do the federal government. It's broader, it's better. It's, um, if you need to do it, you can follow your own trademark. It's a little complex. You may have some questions. There is a help desk that will help you with it. It's lawyers for the most part. Do not ask them the legal question. Don't ask them, how should I do this? Can, uh, what's the best way to say this? Lawyers do that, they won't do that for you. But good heavens, what does this category mean? I don't understand this question. They'll help you through that. And they're really very nice and very helpful. And if you get one that's a real jerk, hang up, call back, you'll get someone else and they'll be better. But so you can probably do your own trademark. 325 bucks per filing. If you need to file in multiple classes, it's 325 per class. Class, um, these guys do sugary caffeine. If they also made um, cell phones, they would have to have a different class. Um, probably there's a different class for 
non-sparkling drinks. There's a whole lot of strange little legal classes. They're all listed online. The website is uspto.gov. That's Patent Trademark Office. uspto.gov. All the information you need is there. Lots of FAQs and all that good stuff. That also is not what we're talking about today. But that means when you start asking about your brand names and your company names, I'm going to show you the bottle to remind you we're not talking about that. Okay. And I didn't have to steal from anyone. Copyright is the artsy stuff and software programming. Um, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense for software programming to be in here. That's my opinion. It is nevertheless in here. It's stupid and wrong, but it's there. We have to live with it. And a lot of what I'm going to talk about with copyright, what's covered and what's not, you'll say, well, wait a minute, how does that, you know, idea expression thing, how does that work in, you know, facts and stuff, how does that work with software? Well, it doesn't very neatly. That's one of the problems. That's a different panel, too. But I'm talking mainly about art. Keep in mind, it does apply to software. Copyright is in the Constitution. It's kind of cool. The purpose of copyright law is to encourage people to create so that the public domain is rich. The founding fathers kind of noticed they had just changed society rather greatly. They'd done away with the aristocracy. They had done away with the established church. Think back to all the medieval art that you looked at and all of the stuff that you read in school. It was all pretty much paid for by either a rich guy who happened to be in the painting or a church and that it was a religious work, right? Well, we did away with those, so we're not going to have any art. That would suck. They came up with a copyright law that, it, that the government says, we will give you, the artist, this limited in time monopoly during which you can sell your stuff and only you can sell your stuff to encourage you to create because it benefits our entire society if there is creative effort. So we're going to make it at least theoretically possible to make a living off your creative expression but only for a limited time, and when you've made enough, after we randomly determine a piece of time that's long enough, then it falls into the public domain and everyone can use it. That's the purpose of copyright law. And it's from the Constitution. We now have a statute that, this is one of my little favorite quirks of it, this 1976 Act is our current, is our current copyright law. People who have not heard me speak before, when would you think the 1976 Act went into effect? 1976, makes sense. Yeah, no, January 1st, 1978. It's the 76th Act. We all call it the 76th Act. If you read the statute, it says in there, print the 1976 Act. Effective date, January 1, 1978. So, Congress moves slowly. 76 Act is what we look at. Most, any question you have, there is a statutory answer to it. The really specific questions come from cases, when people have sued each other over this before, and we kind of know the answers, and so we can say, well, the statute says this, these cases have said this, therefore I think the answer in your situation will be this. That's how lawyers work. And that's what we're dealing with here in copyright law. The basic requirements for copyright is an original work of authorship fixed in a tangible medium. my original work of authorship, fixed in a tangible medium, covered by federal, by federal copyright. I drew this, you know, 50 minutes ago. Aren't you really good? Um, I drew this 50 minutes ago, and it is covered by federal copyright. Because once you have fixed your expression in a tangible medium, written it down, or put it in your computer, computer memory counts, it's covered. Now. If I really cared about this piece of art, although it is the first piece I've ever sold, so I'm a professional artist and that's kind of exciting to me, but if I were really an artist and this was something I really cared about, I would also file to protect it. I am covered by virtue of having drawn it, but if it matters, if I'm making a living doing this, if this is my novel, if this is a piece of art that I am going to sell and make prints of and make money off of, I am going to file the copyright. This is a copyright.gov, and it's easy. You really don't need a lawyer for that at all. The first time you do one, you may have a question or two, just because you know we're lawyers, we'd like to use strange words, but they're easy, and you seriously never need to hire a lawyer to do this. One thing to be careful of, copyright.gov, uspto.gov, not .com. 
When you're typing it, sometimes your fingers are going to do .com in spite of you thinking .gov. It happens. I'm thinking .org. No, no, not, not, not .com, .org. .com is usually used by various different companies who want to charge you extra money to do the filing. And they may or may not do the filing, depending on who's um, picked up that address these days. So be careful. You should be going to a government site. There are fees to file both your patents or both your copyrights and your trademarks. But if you have a third party do it, there are more fees because they're not doing it for free. So just be careful that you go to the actual government site, not something similar. The Library of Congress site is they're the ones who do the copyrights, very easy to maneuver through. If you have questions, they also have the people you can call and ask questions. They also tend to be fairly helpful and nice. They also will not give you legal advice, so think of how you're going to ask your question so that it's a question about the form and a question about filling out the filing, not a question for an attorney. Just be smart about how you answer, ask the question and then they can answer and help you out. Okay, I want to make sure I go through the things I do. So originality in copyright is a low standard. There has to be some. I can't just take a list of words and alphabetize them and get a copyright in that. I have to have done something original, but seriously, this horse is sufficiently original. The one I drew after it, which looked remarkably similar, and is currently still on display in the art show, unless the guy who the next panel tore it down, um, <laughs> looks very similar, but that's fine. They're both sufficiently original. The standard is very low, but there is a standard. That's not usually what you people run up against. What we usually have questions about is, okay, is it fixed in a tangible medium? That's usually an easy question too. Look, I drew it. It's fixed. I wrote it down. It's fixed. I typed it into my computer. It's fixed. I drew it in my computer. It's fixed. All of that counts. Those are your first two statutory requirements. Those are pretty easy. Okay. I actually do have notes. I like to put them in front of me so I make sure we cover what we need to. Your next issue is, is it copyrightable subject matter? This is, again, kind of a threshold issue. Is this the right thing to have a copyright on? Originality and fixation. The next thing we talk about is idea versus expression. The idea of drawing a cute pony with a flower. I can talk about it. I can have it in my head. I can't protect it. Once I draw it, that drawing is protected. But I can't keep other people from having the idea of making a cute pony with a flower and drawing it, probably more, with more talent. I can't stop them from using that idea. Every work, there's a line where you cross over from the idea of the work to the actual expression, the doing of the work. I usually use um, boy meets girl, boy and girl fall in love, things go badly, everyone dies. <laughs> You've read that story many times. Um, that's the idea. More than one person can write that book. In fantasy world, the idea is usually um, young boy lives misery, you know, lives a small miserable life with hard work where everyone hates him. He has no parents. He doesn't understand his heritage. Something strange happens. Usually, some mysterious figure in a robe appears takes the boy somewhere, he has adventures, he learns things, he finds out he's the rightful king, he's a Jedi, he's something. He's a wizard. Actually, the funny thing is, my mom, who is not big into any of these genres, um, saw Star Wars. She actually went with me to see it in the theater when it came out. I'm that old. Um, we saw it. The <laughs> next time she was exposed to science fiction or fantasy was when she was at my house here, so I've now grown up, have a house, moved to Atlanta. And she was here for Christmas, got sick, was stuck in the guest room looking for something to read, had my bookshelf to draw from, and said, oh, this Harry Potter thing, everyone's talking about that, I'll read that. She got halfway through and said, this is a complete knockoff of Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, what? No, it's not. She said, well, look, it's an orphan boy who doesn't know his family. Everyone, ha you know, the, okay, Luke's with his uncle, they didn't hate him, but still. Downtrodden boy, <laughs> discovers he can do magical things. This, you know, dude comes and show, you know, teaches him how. He has to be the one to defeat the big guy in a black robe who's the ultimate evil in the universe. Their names even sound alike. Like Vader. Um, 
If those are the only things you've ever read, they do seem similar, don't they? To us, they don't. We know those are completely different stories. But my mom didn't see the distinction there between the idea and the expression. We see completely different works. Mom said it's the same stupid story. She didn't really like either one of them. <laughs> but so the basic idea is not protected. How you tell that story is protected. And where the line is from the basic plot line to where it's protected, that one's a little fuzzy. But if I start working on the Harry Potter version of the same story, okay, so I'm going to say he is an orphan. He doesn't know anything about his family. Now, here's where Luke is told a little different. You know, Luke knew his dad was dead. Well, that didn't turn out to be true. Oh, I didn't spoil that for anyone. Um, <laughs> so I should have said spoiler alert. Um, he was living with an uncle. You know, so there were some different, and we start to see that they made different choices as they went through it. Harry gets an invitation to a school. Luke gets recruited by a guy in a brown robe. Uh, you know, th so there's different ways that we do it. We take the same basic story, kid doesn't know his heritage, kid learns he can do magical things, and we make it different. <coughs> the details we add, the descriptions we make, the decisions we make about how the kid is, who he is, what his world is like, that's the expression. When you make it something better than boy meets girl, things go badly, everyone dies. <coughs> Somewhere after that, you have both Shakespeare and West Side Story, and a whole bunch of other things. Somewhere you've crossed that magical line into your own work, and that's what's protected. You can't keep someone else from doing the same basic plot. I can't keep someone else from drawing that basic horse. Okay? So that's your idea expression. Another thing that you can't protect are any facts in your work. I don't think there are any facts in Harry Potter or um, Star Wars, but if I wrote a history book, or if I wrote a book about dog training, or if I wrote a book about really stupid things not to do around horses, my expression, how I describe it, what facts I choose and how I arrange them, the sentence structure, the chapter structure, all of those decisions I'm making, those count as creativity, and those are protected. The actual underlying facts, dumb things not to do around horses, I would make that list out of things people have done while I've been riding a half-trained horse. Um, seriously, don't throw a big rock into the creek when I'm riding the two-year-old who's only sort of certain this is okay. Um, there are lots of dumb things not to do. People tend to do them. I'm not dead yet, so it's fine. But those facts, I would not own. You could take all of the factual information out of my book and use it in your own. If I came up with a really great way to make alcoholic Mountain Dew, I don't mean just pouring something into it, but I could make my own product, or even if it was just pouring something into it, I could tell you the best thing ever to pour into your Mountain Dew to make a great adult nighttime beverage, and I could write a book about it, if I really stretched it out. Um, anyone who wanted to could take that same formula, that same pro process, those are really patent things if they were protectable, all the facts I'm giving, all the directions I'm giving, you can have. How I tell it, you can't have. You can't copy my book, but you can take the facts out of it and use those. That makes sense? Okay, we're moving quickly here, seriously. We'd be halfway through the semester at this point. Um, <laughs> compilations can be, copy, can be protected by copyright, but only in the arrangement and the selection. So if I'm collecting other people's works, if I'm collecting poetry that was written by people long since dead, no copyright protection whatsoever, I can use them any way I want, but it doesn't give me an actual, um, no protection over the poems I've collected. Those are already in the public domain. My arrangement and protection and selection of them can be protected, but not the poems themselves. Once something falls into the public domain, I can't pull it back out. So I could do the Ode on a Grecian Urn thing, I could put that in my book of great poetry, but it doesn't give me a copyright over that point. Just the selection and the composite and the how I collected it. Which, if you think about it, it's probably pretty minimal, right? The only thing I probably could keep someone from doing is making the exact same collection of poems in the exact same order. Because if we were to say the best classical poetry of all times, most people, <coughs> if we said best classical poetry as opposed to best modern stuff, would probably come up with a lot of the same works, right? 
Once I've put these poems in my book of best poetry ever, I can't keep other people from using them. I just keep them from copying me. Um, the next one is the one that we will talk about a bit more, which is derivative works. I have the right to make a derivative work. When I did my lovely pony this morning, I made a derivative work of it by adding the color to the flower. Okay? This was difficult because the first pin ran out of it. <laughs> I made a derivative work. I had a work already. It was finished. It was brilliant. I said, you know what it needs is some color. So I made a derivative work. Normally, rather than adding color to a pony, we think of, I have a great novel. I'm going to make a screenplay. I'm going to translate my novel. I'm going to um, take my lovely dialogue and choreograph it on ice. Any of these things, that's making a derivative work. You'll see in a few minutes that gets mushed up into fair use discussion. But the, but the derivative work, I am the only one allowed to change my work. Um, but my derivative work is copyrightable. What I have, in effect, I have two copyrights here, if you will. I have the original work, and I have the derivative work. It doesn't matter here. It's all protected. If I had drawn this, well, no, I'm still alive. It doesn't work. Um, if someone else had drawn this pony, and they were long dead, and this was just a famous piece of art, and I chose to colorize the flower, I do have a copyright in this. My copyright exists only in that flower. Color. Just like my composite, my collection of poetry, only how I collect or the <coughs> ones I chose to collect are covered. When I make a derivative work, the only thing that I'm getting new protection on is the changes, not the underlying work. I can give someone else permission to do it, and then they're allowed to do it if they don't get permission and they do it, they're violating my rights. But if they make a derivative work with my permission, they have a copyright in the derivative work, but only to the extent they changed it not the original. So making a sequel of your novel doesn't pull your novel out of the public domain if it were there already. Does that make sense? So derivative work is another thing that is copyrightable, but only the chain is copyrightable. Computer programs are copyrightable. Um, pictorial, graphic, and sculptural works. Okay, we need that. Pictures, drawings, sculptures. The art stuff, also, protect, also subject matter of copyright. That's what copyright covers. What about um, people who take somebody else's art um, that's not in the public domain and make edits to it and then repost it? That is an infringement. Okay. You have made an unauthored. We'll get to fair use. Okay. okay. Um, but there was a whole panel on it yesterday, so we're not going to spend the whole panel today on it. But if you take some, if you drew the flower, if you colored the flower on my pony and posted it, you would have violated my copyright. Whether I sue you over it is a different issue. Whether you might be able to make a fair use claim is a different issue. But like I said, we'll get to fair use in a minute. I don't want to make it swallow the whole presentation. Ownership is relevant to you guys mainly in two ways. For the most part, whoever creates it owns it. I drew it, I own it. That's easy. I wrote it, I own it. It's tricky in two ways. One is if your boss thinks she owns it. If it's something you do for a living, you have to make sure that it's not something that will be considered a work made for hire. If you are a computer programmer and you want to program some stuff on the side for a, you know, for some extra money or fame or fun, look at what you signed when you started working because you probably signed something saying everything you do is theirs. The nice thing about this is if it's something you're doing that's unrelated to your job, if you program something very pragmatic and boring for your boss and you want to do cool video games, well, what you signed when you started working probably said he gets the video games. Go and say, hey, I want to work on this thing. Has nothing to do with the company. Here's the release or add this as an addendum to my employment contract. This stuff is mine. Don't wait until your work is worth something. Even if it is a video game and your company does something really boring involving widgets, if it's worth a lot of money, your company's going to want it, right? So before it's worth anything, Everybody needs to agree that it's yours. Get them to sign something, even if it's something you draw on a piece of paper. Right, please don't draw it. On a piece of paper. I am working on this game. I am working on games. Whatever you need to do. If your boss agrees, you're good. Don't wait till it's worth money and then people fight about it. Oh, you're doing a computer game on the side. Oh, isn't that cute, you techies? Yeah, whatever. He'll, he won't care. 
Later when it's worth money, he's going to care. If it's a work made for hire, even though you wrote it, you're not the author. You don't own the work the employer does. If you are a scientist working for a university or working for a pharmaceutical company, I guarantee any drugs you develop are not your own. You have agreed that your employer owns them. Same thing for authors, same thing for technical writers. Be careful. The closer what you're doing on the side is to what you do for a living, the closer you are to having a dispute later about whether you actually own it or not. You get tons of rules and tests and stuff. But if that's where you're treading, be careful and look into it more to make sure that you don't find out afterwards that you screwed up. The other thing to be aware of so you don't get into trouble with it is joint ownership. Most of you all are familiar with the Broadway musical Rent. Um, the guy who, um, who wrote it and produced it was um, died after the you know, dress rehearsal, final dress rehearsal right before the show opened. The show became hugely popular. He was dead. Maybe that helped at ours to always make more money. Um, and funny how after there was lots of money there, up comes this woman knocking on the door of his parents saying, hey, guess who I am? I'm the joint author of the musical. Yeah, he forgot to put my name on the playbill. I get half. She was an editor. She helped him. I mean, she did work with him. But he had never thought of her as a joint author. And honestly, I don't know the woman, so I'm slandering her, I suppose. But um, I think that she probably knew she wasn't a joint author at the time. She was being paid to do some work to help him get the script better and get the play better. And you know, she's a polisher of sorts. And then she, but it occurred to her, he was dead. And there was a lot of money there. I like money. No one knows better. I'm an author. I'm a joint author. We intended to work together to make the same thing. Yeah, he didn't put my name on the cover, but we thought that was okay. We agreed to that. And he's not there to argue. If you are working with someone else to make your work, write down what the relationship is. Are they also an author? That gives them a lot of rights to the work. If they are not, get them to acknowledge, I am not a joint author, neither of us has any intention to form a joint ownership here. Because the, ter the test for whether there's a joint author is basically the intention of the parties at the time they did the work. Did you get any money? Hmm? Did you get any money? I don't think she did. I think that, but the lawyers are the ones who really got the money there. Whenever it goes to court, there's one person you know who did well, and that's the litigator. Uh, there's two of them. So there's two people who did well, the lawyers on both sides. Oftentimes you get to the end of it, neither side gets any money, but both sides' lawyers get a lot of money. We set the rules, we benefit from them. It's how it works. So if you are working with someone, even if you're doing, if you're writing the book and you hire an illustrator, write down what the relationship is. Make sure you got, ideally you'll hire an attorney like me to do it. Do not hire a litigator. They say they can draft, they can't. <laughs> it's like getting your dermatologist to take care of your cancer. It's just not smart. They're both smart people. They're both good at what they do, but they can't do each other's jobs. Don't show the heart surgeon the mole that you have, especially the cocktail party. They hate that. <laughs> and don't try to get the litigator to write a contract. Here's the thing. Litigators think they can write contracts. I know I can't try a case. I don't have the skill set. They think they can write contracts. Nevertheless, if you are working with someone, make sure both of you agree what the deal is. Think about what the deal is going to be. Are you going to use their drawings in this edition of the book? Is the artist going to be able to sell those pictures somewhere else? Can you use this in your next edition of the book? Can you use this picture in a different book? Well, there's no law that tells you the answer to that. Copyright law doesn't tell you what your agreement was. You have to make the agreement, and if you can't hire a lawyer to do it for you, at least just write it down in English, not in bullet points. Use complete sentences with punctuation. Otherwise, we can tear it apart and make it mean anything, anything we want it to. Don't be lazy. Write it in real English. Don't try to sound like a lawyer. Please, will of God, don't try to sound like a lawyer. Just write it in plain English. This is not as good as having a lawyer do it, but it's better than nothing. But seriously, if I try to sound like I had serious urban background and I try to sound like a serious urban cred sort of person, 
You guys would laugh yourself stupid. <laughs> That's what you sound like when you try to sound like a lawyer. Don't try to sound like a lawyer. Just write it in English, but use full sentences, subjects, verbs, objects, punctuation, capitalization, all that stuff that no one seems to do anymore. Do it now. Write down, I am using your work, your art. You can sell copies of it later for anything you want. I can use it in any edition of this book. I can't use it for other books. I can or can't, whichever you pick, sell copies of just the art. Yeah, make sure y'all, you don't have to put it in legal terms. It's better if you can't, seriously it is. But if this is a startup thing for you and you're just working with someone else and you're hoping that you'll make some money from it, you can't afford my people. So at least write it in English so you know what the plan is, because then you can at least, when she says later, no, the deal was that I get half of the royalties on your book. Say, no, no, it says right here. You have no rights to the book. I have no rights to use your pictures any other way. You know, write it down that way and you can at least overcome that knock on your parents' door saying, hey, your dead kid didn't tell you, but we're partners and I own half of that. So avoid that knock on the door by planning ahead. Once you own the copyright, the other issue we talk about is transferring. When you transfer rights, we call it a license. I have lots of rights, and I can transfer all or some of them. I'm going to run real quick through the rights you have. It's a bundle of rights. We in law, in law school call it the bundle of sticks because we have no imagination. But picture a bundle of sticks. I can give you one of them. I can give you all of them. I can say, you can have this one, but only for 10 bucks. You can have this one, but you have to give it back to me in an hour. I can do that with my rights under copyright. I don't have to transfer everything. I can give individual sticks. But just like the stick, once I've given it away, I can't also give it to someone else. Right? Unless I say specifically, I'll let you have this stick, but other people are going to have this are going to share it with you. All of those things are possible, but you have to plan it. The rights that you have that you can that are these little individual sticks, the obvious one. The right to copy. We need that. That's why it's called copyright. The right to copy, see how that works? Um, the right to copy, that's the obvious one. The right to derivative works, color my flower, translate my work. The right to distribute, the right to publish, the right to perform, the right to display. Display is really more for brilliant art than novels, but all of those kinds of rights belong to me, the author, until I give them to someone else. Anyone who takes those rights from me, who does one of those things without my permission, has violated the copyright law and is infringing my rights. So it's not just copying. It's also doing any of those other things is an infringement. Now fair use comes in. I know y'all are happy. Fair use is when you say, well, yes, I did that, but I'm really allowed to. This is not an affirmative right. I don't walk around all day with a fair use right. I walk around with a right to free speech. I don't walk around with a right to fair use because fair use only exists after you've been charged with infringement you can use it as an affirmative defense, saying, oh yeah, so what, but. That's, we say it in different words, but that's pretty much the basis. Think of it like self-defense is, is how you can perhaps be exonerated when you've killed someone. Well, yes, I killed him, but I was allowed to because he was trying to kill me first. Okay, in some cases that means I'm not going to be guilty of murder, even though there's a dead bot guy here on the floor, and my pen is through his face. Okay, I did kill him, but I was allowed to because of this. Well, same thing with infringement. Well, yes, I stole his stuff, but I was allowed to because of this. Fair use is murky. If you rely on fair use, you are a braver person than I am because not only is it something that only applies in court, which means you're paying the lawyers to get there, and you don't know whether it was fair use until the judge tells you, there are four factors that we go through to decide if something is a fair use. Um, we have four factors we go through to decide if something is a fair use. Like I said, we talked about this for an hour yesterday. We could talk about it for hours and hours. And you can get copyright lawyers to just throats over this because lots of people care. Those four factors, there's not that you have to meet all of them. And there's no actual numerical guidelines in here. Four squishy factors, and the statute says, balance them. So I'm pretty sure that if you satisfy none of the four requirements, you probably don't have fair use. That's as far as I'm willing to go. And I do this for a living. Here's the factors. First one is purpose and character of the use. 
one part of that is, is it commercial or not? That is not the only part. Some of, you, some of you believe that if I don't sell it, I am allowed to do this. No, that is one part of one of the factors. Now generally, if you're not trying to sell whatever it is you've done, your copy or your whatever, that works to your favor. More realistically, if you aren't selling it, the owner probably doesn't know, and if they do know, they probably don't care. Is this how some uh, webcast say donate or support us they're not really selling a the product they're getting around it that way no no they may think they are but that means nothing okay um there's a lot of people who um we were talking talk to someone in here earlier about you know well on youtube it says you know i can use 10 minutes of this and i have my counter in the corner and if they write sometimes they write the code sections at the bottom saying this is a fair use and they quote the code well, that's cute. I mean, I can say I'm a penguin and I can quote code, but it doesn't make it true. Um, it's not fair use until the judge says so. It's not fair use because you write at the bottom of the screen. There is no 10 minute rule. There is no 10% rule. There is no 10 page rule. There is no rule, put it that way. There are squishy guidelines. First one is what I said, purpose and character of the use. Commercial versus non-commercial. And here's where we get into another one which the litigators love. Is it a transformative use, or is it really just, a rep just re um, repeating the use, or copying and doing the same thing? I drew a flower, I mean, I colorized my flower. I didn't really change this. It's still a drawing of a horse. But if I changed the use of it completely, so it's now something different, well, okay, that may be transformative, or it may just be a derivative work. I can't tell you the logical difference. Judges will sometimes. The second element is the nature of the copyrighted work. Remember we talked about facts aren't covered? So if I have a very factual work, if I have a list of directions for something, that's not going to be really in the heart of copyright. Artwork. This is the heart of copyright. This very drawing. Um, so this very drawing has much more protection and is less a, a copy of it is less likely to be a fair use than if I had factual things or directions. The nature of the underlying work, meaning is it really artsy stuff or is it kind of factual stuff? Um, the amount used. There is no bright line test. I've heard lots of them. None of them are true. There is no bright line test. Can I use, if I use the whole thing and copy it, no. If I use a little piece of it, maybe. Some of the purposes that fair use likes are things like criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, research, those kinds of things. If I write a book review of your new book, I can excerpt pieces of it to put in my book review. We all know that because we've seen it in real publications, not just on the internet, and they don't have to get permission to do that unless they take too much. Gerald Ford wrote memoirs about his entire life. It's a very thick book. Those of you who remember why he's relevant to American history, what is the part that people really wanted to read about? Nixon, Nixon Watergate, and the party. Um, so this magazine got a pre-publication copy of his book, was writing their review of it, and what do you think they published? The part on Nixon, Watergate, and the party. No one wanted to read the book now. They'd already read the good stuff. Ford suit and won. They had taken a very small piece out of his very thick book, but they took the good stuff. So even if it's a little bitty bit, this is one of the reasons there are no real quantitative rules, you can't take just the good stuff either. I've always wondered about this collage artists. Most of them are violating the original artist's rights. Right. And most original artists either don't know or don't care. Okay. There's, I mean, let me put it this way. Because you'll say, but I see people doing this all the time. Well, who here has seen someone in Atlanta driving faster than the speed limit? <laughs> yeah, I said see. I didn't say have done. This is being filmed. We don't. Um, so, were those people breaking the law? Yeah. Were they all getting pulled over? Let's be real. You've been alive more than a few minutes. You know people get away with stuff. A lot of infringement people get away with. Some of it is like fan art. Fan fiction, fan art. Here's the ugly truth. It's all infringement. Virtually none of it would ever qualify for fair use. Let me get the fourth factor in because we're going to go into topics we like. Amount used, effect on the market. Am I going to replace the original 
works market. It's going to cost the author money. Meanwhile, fan fiction, fan art. Sorry, I was three out of four. I had to get the fourth one in. All of it's infringement. I'm sorry, but it is. But you know what? Most of the studios have figured out that if we're spending time writing about Kirk and Spock, we're going to go to the next movie because we really like this. And if we're spending time drawing pictures of the Enterprise, making more stories about what might have happened when Data was young, was he young? I guess he wouldn't have. But you know, <laughs> if we write all of these things down because we're excited about it and we share it with our friends. Now, of course, back when dinosaurs roamed the Earth and I was young, and I did indeed write a brilliant piece of, um, it was really a parody of Star Trek. It was kind of a funny piece. It was brilliant. My friends and I wrote it. Um, in the basement when we were in high school, and it was lovely, and we shared it with all of our friends, and all ten of them. We performed it one day at a party. Well, seriously, we weren't even drinking yet, um, and it was great, and yeah, we were violating all sorts of copyrights, but you know what? Paramount didn't know. Roddenberry was still alive, and although he is indeed all-knowing and all-seeing, he didn't even know, and if he had, he wouldn't have cared, because they had figured out that by letting us do that, no matter how bad the movies are that they put out, we will go see them. If we're doing fan fiction, they love it because they figured out that keeps the market going and they don't have to do anything. Now it's a little different because instead of just our 12 friends seeing it, we could post it and lots of people could see it. Maybe 15 people would read it this. But some of these things get big markets. Paramount doesn't care until you start doing stuff that bothers them. J.K. Rowling had to sue that kid that put together the really good compendium of Harry Potter stuff because she was planning on putting one out. She apparently didn't have quite enough money and had one more thing she wanted to publish. And this 14-year-old kid had put together this website of basically a Harry Potter encyclopedia kind of thing. Most of the stuff that kids put up on their Harry Potter sites, she didn't care about. Because it was kids putting stuff up on their own little websites, their MySpace or something like that. She didn't care. But then this kid suddenly was doing, and he did a great job. It was really high quality, but she wanted to do one. And so suddenly he had created an actual competing work. And she sued and made him stop. Because then she cared. So you can go too far. You can do something Paramount will care about. When you do that, suddenly they will come down and say, hey, you're infringing. And you'll say, but everyone else is infringing. And they'll say, yeah, so we don't care. This is what we care about. Stop doing it. And that's one of the big truths about fan fiction and fan art. Yes, you're infringing. No, you don't have a fair use. But no, you're probably not going to get in trouble because nobody cares until you start selling it. Now that's not the law. That is part. Remember, that's one of part of one of the four elements. But that often is what makes the owners care because then you seem to be competing with them. It's like, wait a minute, they're not just talking about this stuff and loving it. They're making money off of it. We want that money. That should have been our money. So it's not that when money is involved, you're breaking the law. It's that when money's involved, the owner might care. That's really the difference. What are the rules on parody? Because some people make it seem like, oh, I'm, it's a parody so I can do whatever I want. Parody is one of the things that is usually considered a fair use. Saturday Night Live sketches, yeah, they can get away with it. They're usually short and they match the four, the four elements. And they've got lawyers looking over their shoulders usually making sure they don't do something that they think is a little too far outside. A parody can be a fair use. A parody often is a fair use. I could, again, I can talk for two hours on what kind of parody is, what kind of parody isn't, and often, even then, you don't know until the judge tells you because some things that you look and say, that's not a parody. The judge says, oh, that was a parody. And, you know, so it's not something you can rely on because it's going to cost you a lot of money to be proven right. Um, most parodies are, but many are not. Weird Al usually gets permission. Hmm? Weird Al usually gets permission. Yes, because... and this is perfect because this is the big lesson I want to tell you guys. Ask permission. Um, when I had this up in the art show, I'm, I'm a professional artist. Um, when I had this piece up in the art show, a couple of people in the front here took pictures of it. They're like, whoa, 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 whoa. You just violated my copyright. Wow. The whole point was I said, hey, I have a copyright in this art. And then they took a picture. I'm like, dude. <laughs> I have a copyright in that. You just made a copy. You just violated federal law. But I tell you what, it's okay with me if you do it. Everybody who wants to can take a picture of this pony. Anyone who wants a picture of this can do so. But you can't sell it for money. I can make that the rule too. 
If you want to have something that you share like that with certain conditions, creativecommons.org. This is the only kind of legal thing you can download off the internet that's a contract that's worth crap. These are good. They have lots of licenses. If you want to share your work and allow people to use it or use it in certain ways, these licenses are great. You can use them. If you want to use someone else's work, look for some that have the Creative Commons mark on them. Now, notice my pony does not have that little C in a circle, right? Everyone can see this. There's no little C in a circle anywhere on my brilliant piece of art. Doesn't need to be. So if you're looking for stuff you can use to make a collage or whatever, don't think, oh, there was no copyright mark on it, therefore there's no copyright. No, no. I drew this, it's copyrighted. That dude in the front violated my copyright until I told him he could. Weird Al. Seems like parody, right? He never had to worry about being sued because he always asked permission. Most people said, really? Do you want to do my song? I think you're great. Cool, go ahead. And when people said, no, you suck, don't touch my work, he didn't. He didn't get sued. <coughs> Otherwise, he would have. Ask permission. If the owner of the work says you can do it, then it's permissive use and it's not infringement. You don't have to worry about fair use. If the, uh, if the author has published it under a Creative Commons license, they've told you what you're allowed to do. You have to call them. You can look and read it and say, oh, good, I can do these things. Follow the rules. Do what they say. If you get permission, it's not infringement. So ask permission. And here's the next part of it, though. If the author says no, if the artist says no, if the musician says no, don't do it. Use something else. Make your own stuff, whatever, unless you can afford to finance a lawsuit. Because that's the risk you're taking. Let me see if there's anything else significant I have to say, or we can move to the questions. Um, yeah, we can go to questions. Throw the box out there. What, was the, what about live performance? Look at the cover. There are very specific rules for covering music. Um, someone, who's, someone who is someone who is performing music needs to have an ASCAP license. This is all legal minutia, but there are rules for how you can do it and what you can do. And um, it's beyond what we can talk about here, frankly. But there's rules that you're going to have to have. If you're performing live art, you are allowed to. It's called a compulsory license. 102. <laughs> it's actually, music law. Um, it's a compulsory <laughs> license. Music has its own weird rules. This is something that I think should be used in fair use, frankly. That's a different panel, too. Maybe Meredith has to do that one next year. Um, how we think it should be fixed. I think that we should use something like a compulsory license in fair use. The compulsory license is, yes, you can perform this song, and you have to pay to do it. And it's done through ASCAP and BMI, who I assume keep most of the money for themselves, but that's how the world works. So there are rules about it. You, the general rule is you can perform it, you can't change it. And you have to pay ASCAP to do it. I, ha I have to go where the box goes. This is a rule. It keeps me out of trouble. Is there an onus to defend copyright, or is that trademark I'm thinking of? I don't understand. If you don't defend it, you're essentially... Any time in the law, it. if you don't defend your rights, there's an argument that you're letting them kind of die. With copyright, if you don't go after the first 10 infringers, you can still go after the 11. So saying you let them get away with it is doesn't really matter. In what domain is that more relevant? Is that trademark? Trademark can matter more that way. Um, because in trademark, you're worried about something completely different, though. It's not really a, sli a sleeping on your rights thing. It's more of a um, genericization. Um, refrigerator used to be a trademark. Aspirin used to be, be a trademark. Xerox came really, really close to um, being a generic word for copier. Xerox used to print full-page ads in the Wall Street Journal saying, please don't use our name as a verb. It is a Xerox copy machine, not a Xerox machine. And please don't go Xerox something. Please make a copy on your Xerox machines. If people start using your brand name for the noun, like Kleenex Band-Aid. Um, Google, um, I don't know. They just write their own rules. I'm not even going to opine on Google, because Google always watches me, so I don't like to piss Google off. <laughs> but if you, in a trademark, you're more worried about the mark disappearing, because you let it be used wrong. And that's not, that doesn't really, it's a trademark, it lasts as long as you use the mark. So Coca-Cola will own their name forever. Unlike something that's a copyright, like, oh, say, a cartoon of a mouse piloting a ship, um, 
when that cartoon falls out of copyright, there's a limited term of copyright. It's currently life of the author plus 70 years. It used to be two shorter terms, and there were lots of complications. Um, remember I said the copyright doesn't have to be at the bottom of this. I don't have to file it. I don't have to write the copyright name on it. None of the stuff that used to make you lose your copyright, oh, well, she published it without the copyright notice. Used to destroy your copyright, completely irrelevant now. You can publish it however you want, with or without the C, but trademark is a completely different thing because it lasts forever until you stop using it. So the idea of not enforcing it has a different take completely because it's a different law. Why do so many otherwise intelligent people then insist on putting the copyright on their work on their work on the first page and they'll register a pick as copyright? Is that just taking Well, it's co it's be, it, it, it is covered by copyright because they fixed it in a tangible medium. So it is covered by federal Without copyright. That on there. You, you don't need to see the C is yeah. irrelevant, but how many of y'all lock your car doors? How many of you have seen how quickly thieves can get into cars, either by just going through the glass or using a slim jim? You lock your car doors anyway, don't you? <coughs> I put a C on anything that I care about. I tell my clients, put the little C in a circle on your work. It doesn't matter, but people think it does. And sometimes it'll keep people, it'll keep opportunity crimes from happening. Someone will look on the internet and say, oh, that has this copyright mark. That means I can't steal it or I can't take it. This one doesn't. I can't. They're wrong, but the guy who put the C on his work didn't get stolen from. He can break into my car anyway, but when I'm doing that, really all I have to do is make the next car more attractive. But so even right. though it's not going to solve all my problems, I lock my door. If you use the .gov site to register mm -hmm. something, will it give you feedback? Oh, this is really close to something that's already out there that you didn't realize. Copyright doesn't have to be unique. If I went into a trance and wrote a book about a kid who became a wizard in a place called Hogwarts, I would have independently created it, and I'd be allowed to. I didn't copy Rowling. I would have had to have never read her book, probably, to make it legitimate. But if I honestly independently created, if those monkeys with the typewriters actually did you know, draft one of the sonnets, it wouldn't be a copy. It would have been an independent creation, so it would have been fine. And that's a different issue. And your question was slightly different. Did that, what did you actually ask? Okay. I know you had mentioned the uh, copyright versus why go through it. Isn't there a difference in, uh, so like say, you know, you drew your, your, your unicorn, so it's copyrighted. If I put a horn on it, or I can make horn, a derivative sorry, work. From here, it's hard to see. And then say, you know, so that is copyrighted now. If you right. go through and you do the registration and the fees, don't you have more, you can get more money back technically. Yes. Apple, correct? If or it's a work you care about, you file it because if there's ever going to be a lawsuit, if you need to sue to protect it, you need to have filed it to really make it meaningful. So if it's this, I'm not going to spend the 35 bucks and file for this. I could. Maybe I should since it's my first professional artwork. But I, I'm not going to. I've filed some of my kid's artwork just so he can say he has a copyright. But I'm not going to file because I don't care. If I'm actually an artist, I'm going to file everything because then I have much more meaningful protection. 5.30 in the high. Yes. <laughs> That's if, if the next find, panel. If you find some of your work on the internet mm -hmm. uh, and you want to get it down, is there like a standard set of steps that you Yes, the DMCA, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Sort of sounds like the village people, but it's not as much fun. Um, <laughs> there is a standard procedure you go through. If you see your stuff up there, you go to the provider, whoever's posted it, and say, hey, that's mine, take it down. If you um, are going against an ISP, you want to make, take the time to get the real legal language. Otherwise, you can just call, you, if you just contact the company that's posting and say, did I own that? They usually will take it down. If you use the magic words from the code, the DMCA, they, there's a, a little dance that everyone goes through. You give them the official takedown notice. If you're the owner, they will say, oh, okay, and they'll take it down. And then if the guy who posted says, hey, dude, that wasn't his, they can file a complaint and say, put it back up. And about that point, the ISP gets to say, I'm so out of this. You guys go settle it in court without us. But it usually stays down until a judge says, put it back up. So there's a definite format that you go through. If it's a Facebook or a um, major place like that, when you give them to take notice, they usually just take it down. And sometimes they're not willing to put it back up even when they should. Some companies are using, um, you know, just letting the computers figure it out as to what should be taken down and what isn't. That's its own issue. I, I, I have to go to the box. Are there any companies or reasons why things will go further than a cease and desist? 
A cease and desist letter. Here's one of those big things I hear people miss, who are confused about. A cease and desist letter isn't really a specific set of rules like the DMCA. You send a cease and desist letter, you being a lawyer, send a cease and desist letter because you really don't want to sue everyone. So just take this crap down. We don't need money from you. We own that. Take it off your play site. Or stop using my stuff in whatever you're doing. I send you a cease and desist letter. I send you that because it's usually easier to scare you into submission than it is to actually sue you. If you ignore my cease and desist letter, well, if I was just bluffing, well, then nothing's <coughs> going to happen next. But if I really am going to sue you, then I'm going to sue you. And there's no magic time period. There's not, well, if they send the cease and desist letter, they have to send two follow-up letters, or I have, I've heard I have 100 days from the issuance of a cease and desist letter. Well, issuance is the wrong word anyway. I just wrote it. I'm a lawyer. I made it sound scary because I really want you to take the stuff down. I don't want to have to sue you. But there's no rules. If you get the cease and desist letter, though, if, if you are kind of skating the edge of I'm assuming this is a fair use and I want to do this, I don't think anyone will care. Well, when you get the cease and desist letter, guess what? Someone cares. Take it down, otherwise you're going to court. But uh, can you think of certain cases that have come up that have gone further in fandom? I don't quite understand. The cease and desist letter is just your warning. It's I'm not going to kill you yet if you stop, but if you keep doing it, I'm going to have to kill you. Uh, I'm just looking for, has there been any it's not really a legal issue, it's just a tool. It's just a name for a type of letter. You are violating my stuff, knock it off, is what it is. How many warnings I give you is completely up to me. There's no rules, there's nothing really to sue about on it. But when Paramount sends you that, it means quit drawing the Enterprise. Last question. Lucky. I will answer questions outside afterwards for those of you who want to. but. They need to give this room to someone else. For musicians, can you give um, a good resource to find out about musician copyright things and um, oh. how to connect with the true owner of maybe a, a sample of a song you want to use? That's that you'll need to do through probably ASCAP and BMI. I have a book that is good. Um, I'll need to give you my email so I can send you the name of the book because it's someone on music copyright and I don't remember the full name. Look at what happened to Barry and Snoop Dogg. Yeah. I mean, you'll get in trouble with it. And the yeah. best thing is, when what you're doing is successful, that's when you get in trouble. And that's when you really want to enjoy being successful. Yeah. So that's the difference. Thanks.